Uh, welcome, everyone, to the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Um, as many of you know, I'm Elizabeth Donahue. I run Public and External Affairs here, and we're always happy when people come to our events. And today's is um, particularly interesting, given as we're about to really launch into the election cycle. Um, we are, we've paired up with Bloomberg View to host a talk on the presidential election, and a panel discussion, Is the Welfare State on the Ballot in November? Um, I'm really going to introduce our moderator, who comes from Bloomberg View, and he will introduce the rest of the panel. Josh Barrow, who is the lead writer for Bloomberg View's news and economics blog. And now you can hear me. <laughs> I hope I was projecting before. You didn't miss anything. Um, so Josh Barrow is our moderator, and he's the lead writer for Bloomberg View's news and economics blog, The Ticker, and he will moderate our discussion and tell you who you get to hear from today. Thanks. Great. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, it's really exciting to be here, um, and I think we're going to have a really fun discussion today. Um, our panelists today, uh, we have Clyde Crook, um, who is an editor and columnist for Bloomberg View, um, uh, and is a member of our editorial board. He also uh, writes for The Atlantic. Um, Michael Kinsley, uh, who is uh, also an, an editor and columnist at Bloomberg View, uh, founding editor of Slate and formerly an uh, editor of both uh, The New Republic and Harper's. Um, we have, at the end of the panel, uh, Nolan McCarty, who chairs the Department of Politics here at Princeton. Um, he's also a professor at the Woodrow Wilson School. Uh, and finally, we have Marcus Winter, uh, who's an associate professor of politics and public affairs, and he's the co-director of the Center for the Study of Democratic Politics um, at the Woodrow Wilson School. Um, and so today's panel will be uh, on the welfare state um, and whether this, question, whether this election is a referendum on the welfare state. Um, this election has been sort of unusual in that so much of the policy discussion has been about long-term questions about big entitlement programs. President Obama's signature uh, legislative achievement, the P Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, is the largest expansion of the welfare state since the Johnson administration, um, and Mitt Romney is vowing to repeal it if he's elected. Um, the candidates have sharply different plans about what to do with both Medicaid and Medicare, the two main health entitlement programs um, in the United States. Um, that would uh, that would have a lot that would have great impacts on how healthcare is delivered over the next 50 years. Um, there are also um, significant differences about what to do with food stamps, um, and uh, the Romney campaign has essentially invented an attack um, against the Obama campaign, claiming that Barack Obama has gutted the welfare reforms of the Clinton era. Um, so this election basically seems to be about welfare, but there are a couple of oddities with that. One is that the really pressing economic questions that the next administration is likely to deal with, likely to deal with have to do with short-term economic problems that don't have a lot of relationship to the long-term budgetary issues that are addressed when we, when we reform entitlement programs. Uh, there's also a little bit of a disconnect in the discussion about what entitlement should be. Um, we think of Republicans as advocating for a smaller welfare state and Democrats for a larger one, but there's also a fight over who, would, who will get the benefit of entitlements. Mitt Romney's actually running on about $700 billion more in Medicare spending than Barack Obama proposes over the next 10 years. So the big question for me then is, is this election really about the welfare state? How big will the actual policy impact be on the welfare state, depending on who is elected, and what will the nature of those differences be? So I'd like to throw that question out to the panel to give some opening remarks on that, and then we'll have some, uh, some free-flowing discussion. Around 5.30, we'll take some questions from the floor. Um, also, I may uh, take the prerogative of taking some questions off Twitter. Um, if you would like to send any questions, the hashtag for that is Princeton View. Um, so why don't we start uh, with Clive over at this end. Okay. <clears throat> well, no disrespect to whoever came up with the title for this panel, but uh, my uh, unguarded reaction to it when I saw it uh, I mean, as a Brit was, what welfare state? I, mean, I don't really think of the U.S. as having a welfare state that can be either, uh, certainly not one that could be dismantled. Um, I mean, in, in Europe, the term means something uh, much wider than uh, you know, social insurance programs like Social Security and Medicare. It describes um, you know, a very generous uh, safety net, far, far more generous than uh, the one that the U.S. Um, pr provides. Or, I've ever seen serious discussion about providing in the US. So it, it just seems like an, uh, an odd term to me. Um, 
As to uh, you know, the debate about reforming entitlements, um, I, I'm not sure that in, the, in this uh, presidential election we're, we're getting any serious uh, discussion of that. I want to make a slight exception for uh, the Ryan proposal, or at, at any rate, the latest iteration of the Ryan proposal on Medicare. Whether you think, that's, uh, whether you think it's a good idea or a bad idea uh, to replace Medicare with a voucher, uh, style system. Um, I think that's at least um, an intelligible proposal uh, that's worth debating. One thing uh, is certain, and that is to get a grip on Medicare spending in the medium and longer term, we're going to have to do something to expose the system to more uh, budgetary discipline, either through uh, quasi-market pressures, which is the idea behind the voucher, you get patients, you get customers exerting downward pressure on costs, or through more intrusive uh, central control, which I think is the, is the Obama administration's preferred approach. My guess is that the Obama administration's preferred approach would work better, but certainly something has to be done to get Medicare spending under control, and at the moment I don't think we are having um, a very intelligent, um, remotely serious uh, debate about that. The disconnect, I'll just make one more point just before handing over, the disconnect you mentioned uh, between short term and long term I think is a critical, absolutely critical thing that um, uh, to my mind a relatively straightforward solution to uh, the country's fiscal problems is available. And it's a blueprint, a blueprint along the lines of the Bold Simpson proposal. And what that involves is fiscal ease, a fiscal moderation in the short term, uh, which the economy still needs because the recovery is so slow, combined with meaningful but far from drastic steps to contain uh, spending in the long ter longer term, combined also with uh, tax increases that will fall not just on the rich, but on the middle class as well. If that whole uh, program were uh, enacted, the large fiscal problem that we confront in this country would be more or less solved. And that solution, it seems to me, is close to painless. If you did all those things, um, you could adopt a moderate approach under each heading and the problem would be solved. It's a great shame, in my view, that neither candidate is supporting uh, uh, Bull Simpson. And um, until the debate moves in that kind of direction, I don't think we'll get serious about these issues. Well, I'm saying, uh, saying that, that Bull Simpson will solve all our problems is like saying, you know, um, a magic fairy will come down <laughs> and, and, and solve all our problems. And Bull Simpson is, is, is our politics are so, so screwed up that, that Paul Simpson doesn't is steps on too many toes, and um, so I think that's that's not going to do it. Um, is the, is the debate about um, is the welfare state? It wasn't really because of what Pi said. We don't really have a welfare state here. We have these individual programs that we're very attached to. Um, but Romney sort of did make it about the welfare state with that video that was released a week ago because he, he really suddenly discussed this in terms of, of class and, and he's talking about 47% of the population and he's, he's assuming that the people who are on welfare are the people who are going to vote for Obama and it's all of a piece. And, um, so you could say, yes, we are now having uh, an, uh, an argument about the welfare state, and uh, I think the welfare state is winning. Uh, Marcus? Uh, so I, I was actually going to answer the question, and I think I would answer it in the negative. So I, I, I would argue the, the welfare state is not on the ballot, and it's neither objectively on the ballot if you think about it in terms of you know, a referendum on should there be a serious gutting of the welfare state or a serious expansion. We're in a situation that really is very, very different from that. Um, and I would also argue that subjectively to most voters, this is not about the welfare state. So let me take a few minutes to sort of um, elaborate on both of these points. I think, so clearly what's on the ballot is the, the, the two parties are 
Obama and Romney, and I, I think the proposals they have offered are actually not particularly specific to, to make it anything close to a referendum where there would be a specific proposition to be voted on about policy. And that's, that's nothing new. That's how American politics works. And the implication is that the policy changes that occur after the election, they will, they will be incremental. If, if Romney said right now he wanted to get rid of the you know, major portions of the welfare state or change the tax structure, if he said that right now, chances are that would not be implemented, right? Because Romney alone couldn't do that. And I think the probability of having a, a majority in the Senate for the Republican Party that's filibuster proof is essentially zero, and the same is true on the other side. Um, for the Democrats. That's just not going to happen. So whatever, whatever happens after is going to be incremental and in some sort of compromise, either a big one or a small one. I'm not saying the voters know this in, in this level of detail, but they might actually be sensing that usually what comes out of Washington is incremental and to their mind perhaps somewhat disappointing although that would not necessarily be my, my evaluation. And then, on the, so I think you can't really argue that there's a big choice here on, on the welfare state dimension. And then as far as what voters are thinking about right now, I think they're thinking about economic growth and unemployment, and they're thinking about why the economy is not doing better. And even healthcare is pretty far down on the list of priorities. So I, I looked briefly at, at some polling data on this in the the most recent New York Times, CBS New York Times poll from just about a week ago asked about the most important um, problem that this campaign is about in, in voters' minds. And in those kinds of questions, voters are asked to just name whatever is on their mind. There's no sort of uh, closed choice, multiple choice um, answer. So off the top of their head, 37% of, of respondents said the economy or jobs, and then healthcare had 11%, and Medicare and Medicaid had only 2%. And this is this is after we've been talking about, you know, Paul Ryan on the ticket and Medicare proposals for several weeks. Two percent say say Medicare, Medicaid, and then it, it, a slightly different question was was asked by Pew at, um, also last week. What's the main reason why you would um, like to see your candidate win? And it's and, and it's asked about the candidate that they ex they had expressed a preference for. And on that one. It's, there, you know, you can give personal reasons and you can give all kinds of reasons. So people say a lot of stuff, but they don't really say anything related to the welfare state for the most part. So again, health care and Medicare is mentioned by 7% of Obama voters as their main reason and 4% of Romney voters as their main reason to support their candidate. And then everything else literally is a zero or, or two percentage points. So Social Security is not mentioned at all by Romney voters. It's mentioned by 2% of Obama supporters, uh, support for reducing the size of the government. 2% of Romney voters say that. That's it. 1% of Romney voters said that their main reason is that Obama is a socialist. So it's sort of like we're, we're really at, 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 at very small single digits here. And if you add it all up, you again don't get much farther than 10% of the public thinking in terms of the welfare state being the most important thing here. So I, I would say in terms of a big choice, a stark choice, no, it's not on the ballot. Incremental change, yes, I think voters are aware that one party is more supportive than the other, but they don't expect big change. Okay. So I, I took uh, the question to be a, a fairly broad one, not just uh, simply about the, the programs of the, well, of the welfare state or uh, the social insurance or redistributive programs, but also the politics of uh, inequality in, in the U.S. So I think one way of parsing the answer might, might be to agree that uh, the welfare state itself in terms of big major changes uh, to, long, to the funding and the structure of entitlement programs is, is probably not on the ballot. Uh, but the politics of uh, income inequality and class, uh, uh, differential tax rates across uh, different groups uh, clearly is. Um, Interestingly, the questions raised by today's panel are really close to ones I've spent a uh, better part of my career uh, working on. Uh, during this time, uh, during the last 15 years or so, I've spent most of my time trying to understand the causes and consequences of political polarization uh, in the United States. So I think I have a few things to say about what Michael called our, our, screwed, up, our screwed up politics. 
So let me just give you the, kind of the long, uh, uh, the long picture here. <laughs> Uh, so to get at the questions of political polarization, uh, my collaborators and I have developed measures of partisan polarization in Congress that go back more than 150 years, well back into the 19th century. The upshot of this analysis is, surprise, surprise, uh, we're at currently uh, historically high levels of, uh, of polarization within, within Congress among elites. There's some debate among political scientists the extent to which this extent down to the electorate but we're at levels that exceed uh, that measured at the end of Reconstruction, a period of time which uh, you know, the two parties literally uh, had just fought a civil war against each other. But the, the other point is that these party divisions haven't always been uh, so strong. There was a long period, roughly between the 1920s uh, and the 1970s, where polarization among our, part, uh, among our partisans, at least in Congress, uh, went to low levels and maintained low levels uh, through the 1950s and 60s. Uh, it's really only in the late 1970s, at least according to our measures, uh, that partisan polarization has been on this uh, wild upswing uh, that we've witnessed uh, over the past uh, few decades. But I think more relevant to today's discussion is a second of our finding, and that is going back you know, over 100 years, levels of partisan uh, rancor, polarization, whatever you want to call it, uh, tend to track levels of economic inequality very closely. So the periods in which polarization is high, income inequality tends to be high. Periods in which income inequality is low, polarization uh, tends to be low. And this is the result of the fact that both of these things uh, interact with each other very closely. Income inequality creates uh, divisions across economic groups that are always reflected in our party system and exacerbates them. But also uh, political polarization either produces or maintains policies that exacerbate income inequality. So, there's a long, so this has happened over a long period of time and currently, as we all know, we're in a period of high polarization uh, and high uh, inequality. Third factor I won't say much about is that periods of high polarization, high income inequality tend also to be, uh, for reasons not well understood, periods of high immigration. So uh, concerns about national identity, nativism, whether or not the welfare state's beneficiaries are going to uh, uh, look like uh, the people who are paying the taxes contribute to kind of a, a very negative uh, politics toward the welfare state. And again, we're in one of these high immigration, high polarization, high inequality areas. So it's what I would call kind of a, a, a political equilibrium, a bad one perhaps, depending on your perspective, but it's one that's been around and growing over the past 30 years. But there's something really interesting about this election uh, in that even though it's, I would argue, the culmination of lots of trends going back to the, middle the mid 1970s, um, is that the presidential campaigns themselves are much more actively engaged uh, in the rhetoric of the politics of redistribution than they have been uh, in the past. Up until now, I would argue the politics of redistribution has really been something that drives uh, partisan office holders, elites, activists, intellectuals, and only to perhaps to a limited ex extent voters. But for the most part, presidential candidates have kind of shied away from this type of rhetoric. I would say at least and since 1984 when Ronald, Ronald Reagan beat Walter Mondale after Mondale famously proposed to, to raise taxes, presidential candidates have really shied away from tackling these, uh, these issues of class and economic distribution heads on. Think about the, the moderate images of George H.W. Uh, Bush, again arguing against government but arguing it could easily be replaced by volunteerism or Bill Clinton wanting to mend but not end welfare. Or George Bush uh, is a compassionate conservative. Rhetoric about redistribution has really been muted. There was a, a brief appearance of it in 2008, remember Joe the plumber, uh, but it tended not to be something that the presidential candidates themselves have engaged in. But now I would argue perhaps we're now at kind of an apotheosis. This year we have tropes of the 99% versus the 1%, the newer one, the 47% the versus the 53%, the makers and the takers, and, and kind of what I would think is almost a silly debate about who built what. Uh, so it's, it's kind of fundamentally different than what we've seen in terms of presidential 
presidential rhetoric. So I would argue we've had the welfare state and redistribution on the ballot. It's been there for 30 years, but this is an interesting kind of watershed election where it becomes perhaps the most salient, uh, one of the more salient issues in the election and perhaps a, you know, a referendum on the, direction of these, uh, on the direction of these policies. So perhaps if Marcus is right that the welfare state's not on the ballot, perhaps it, you know, uh, you know, perhaps it, it should be. But I would have uh, appreciated a, you know, a somewhat uh, uh, more uplifted discussion of, about these issues uh, than what we've seen in the, in the past few weeks. Can, can I ask a question about polarization? Sure. Um, polarization, to me, would be you have one side saying, we want to raise taxes in order to increase social welfare benefits, and the other one saying we want to cut taxes and get rid of, cut social welfare benefits and, and cut taxes. But that's not what we've got. What we've got is, is sort of everybody saying I want my taxes cut, I don't want to touch my social, I don't want the government messing around with my social security sure. classic formulation. And that doesn't seem to me, and that's the problem, it seems to me, not, not polarization where you would choose one side or the other. Oh, that's right. I mean, I mean they come in packages. So it's very similar to why we can't get to, to Bowles, Bowles Simpson. So we have the, you know, there, there is a plan. It's imperfect, but there's a plan on the table. And different sides diverge about which taxes and which benefits uh, are, are to be cut. And, it, and it's, those it's those divisions. Um, and they cut, across, they cut across class. They cut across lots of other things. But I think uh, there is a kind of a lack of a center uh, in Washington in American politics that can kind of make those kind of grand, grand compromises. So when I talk about polarization, I kind of mean that absence of kind of a center, the ability to, to have representatives who are in a position both to simultaneously raise taxes, not just on the rich, but as Clive said, the middle class too. Uh, but at the same time, and, and people on the other side willing to take uh, some modifications and cuts to kind of, you know, pre-existing entitlement programs. But I think, if I, if I could just interject, and not wanting to put words in your mouth, I mean, it seems to me the point Mike's making there, I think, go ahead. I, and I, I think it's, this is, it is very interesting, is that the, you know, you've got the combination of seemingly uh, intense polarization in the way in the way you describe you know these tropes about distribution and inequality very uh, 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 move very much to the fore and yet at the same time it, it's it's phony because there is a there is so to speak a very broad consensus on don't raise my taxes and don't cut my benefits you see what I'm saying <laughs> I mean the, the, the symbolism is is polarized and people attach themselves with, in my view, insane zeal to one party or the other. And yet, on the big questions, uh, people are agreed, you know, uh, in a way that paralyzes the government. Yeah, no, I, I, no, I understand. I, I mean, my point would only be that it's which taxes and which benefits. And I can all agree that uh, your taxes should go up and your benefits right. should go down, but mine should be different. So we're on the different sides of the, we're on different sides of the spectrum. And it's it just increasingly been the case that for whatever reason, uh, our governmental institutions have not been able to kind of build those grand compromises that, you know, raise your taxes and cut your benefits and raise my taxes and cut my benefits. And, and that, I think, you know, we, is where the problem lies. I would, I would push back on, on what Clive and Michael are saying, actually, because I, I lean toward the idea that this, this election is a, a referendum on some portion of the welfare state. And where I see the disagreement is that you, you have Romney Ryan running on basically repeal Obamacare which is a means-tested health care entitlement, cut Medicaid by a further $800 billion over 10 years, which is about a third of the program. Um, so these are really deep cuts to aid to the poor, and yet hold Medicare harmless from cuts, spend an extra $700 billion on it. Um, and so what I see is, yes, you can't, there's no way to reach a consensus on a deficit reduction deal, partly because it's not economically necessary yet. Um, but what you're jockeying for is which programs are going to be protected so that when somebody's ox inevitably gets gored, it's not yours. Right. So, I, and I think there is a real substantive difference there. The, you know, Democrats, it's not that they love cutting Medicare, but they, they view it as a lower priority than other, than, than 
means tested than effectively. increasing Medicare. Right. So I think the um, I, I think there is a real substantive policy disagreement here. No, nobody's saying that we shouldn't have any sort of entitlement programs, including means tested ones. But I think that there is, you know, the, it's not just, you know, don't cut benefits. There are there is a subset of benefits that Republicans want to cut. And there is a subset of taxes that Democrats are willing to raise now that isn't enough to close the budget gap, but it's, you know. It's, yeah, it's true. I yeah. agree with that. I mean, but it's a question of degree. I mean, you know, how big is that? Is that dis a disagreement substantively <clears throat> measured against the ferocity of the rhetoric? And I think that there's a gap there. You know, in the end, what we'll do is something actually along bold Simpson lines. Whoever's whoever's in charge, that's what the system will default to when it does become necessary. I mean, I I, I disagree with you about you know when it's necessary. We don't need fiscal tightening now, but we need to plan for fiscal control later, partly to make room now for more fiscal ease. But I mean, putting that, putting that issue to one side, you know, the mm -hmm. timing of, of, the, of, of the stimulus, whether we need more stimulus or not more stimulus, I think there'll be more convergence on, far more convergence on the actual things we have to do uh, to get public borrowing under control than either party is remotely willing to admit at the moment. It's mostly posture. Of course, it's always possible that the system will default to default when that time comes. And so that's the, that's the threat that's going to kind of drive um, a lot of these negotiations. I would add one thing about you know, the programs for which neither party is really saying that they're going to cut, and this is obviously Social Security and, and Medicare. Um, it's, you know, I mean, to paraphrase something Justice Scalia said recently, you, know, you can be ideological without being stupid. Uh, I mean, there is broad support among, you know, the middle class, even, even you know, it, a lot's been made of the fact that Tea Party supporters, you know, want their Medicare and Social Security protected as much as anyone else. But it's because of a reason that political scientists have studied for a long time, which is that there's, when you think about these social policies, there's a sense of, deserve, of deservedness and undeservedness. Right. And so these middle class programs that were designed as, you know, uh, you know, we, we pay into Social Security, the trust fund, the money's there, it comes back to us, it's our, it's our money, versus, you know, Medicaid, welfare, and so forth, that people have perceived that the recipients are undeserving. And then, so that's where issues of kind of race, ethnicity, immigration, kind of play into kind of a, a nastier politics yeah. about programs uh, toward the poor. Yeah. Can I just want to say one thing about, I think there's a, we're having two discussions. One is about what you know, what the influence of voters is on policy or on this election more, more proximately. And the other is about likely policy change. And I think the two don't have that much to do with each other. And that's not a cynical view. It's just, it's, it's just very unrealistic to, to expect that voters would know very much about what Simpson-Bowles is. So that, that we will not at some point reach, reach a stage where there's popular demand for any kind of detail of reform, right? It's right. just a matter. At some point, the elites will make a calculation that it's, it's OK to reach consensus, or they should just hold out a little bit longer and you know, catastrophe, or not catastrophe, that's way too strong a word, perhaps. But you know, some sort of even more dire situation will come a little bit more, you know, a little bit closer. But, it's, but I think that's a calculation that's not about which pieces have majority support in, in these reforms or anything like that. No, so, I mean, sorry. Go ahead. I was just to say, more at issue almost is, is as it were, the mere fact of, of coming to agreement. I mean, that, that, is what, that is what the, isn't that really what the debate is about? Is about, you know, that the um, supporters of each party mainly oppose coming to any kind of accommodation with the other party. Let's not worry about the details, you know. If the Democrats want this, that's bad. We don't, we don't want that, and, and, and conversely for the Republicans. I mean, that, that's what parties are organized around, a kind of blind fury about the immorality of the other guy's position. And actually, it reminds me, I wanted to respond to what you said, Marcus, right at the beginning when you were going through those poll numbers about what people care about. They don't care about Social Security. They don't care about Medicare. They only care about the economy. That, it, that's rather odd it, on, if, if, you know, once you notice um, that polarization is, is as strong as it is, you know, that party identification is as strong as it is. 
Because why should concern about the economy align people so trenchantly towards one party or the other? What's driving that must be some set of values about maybe not the welfare state. I, I, I still think that term jars in the US, but about the role of government. You know, that's not the organizing principle, isn't it, for the two for the two parties. And people align around that principle and then you know, the greatest sin, the greatest treason is to reach out and come to an accommodation with the other side. That's the bind we're in. So I guess I'm agreeing. It doesn't, doesn't have much to do with the details of policy. You know, if I'm a Democrat, I'll go with that, along with anything as long as the Republicans don't like it. That, that, that's, the, that's the position. <laughs> Marcus, where in your, in your uh, polls were all the socialists? I mean, one, one of the amazing things about this election, to me, is those don't seem to be, no one seems to care anymore about things that they, they, they profess to care very deeply about. <laughs> you know, abortion and, and prayers in schools and burning the American flag and all that, all that. And it used to be that the, the class war was Republicans, you know, trying to paint Democrats as outsiders, not, not really Americans, not as American as they are. And, um, and uh, now this is in a place with what, in my opinion, is, is a more rational class war between <laughs> um, wealth, well, the wealthy and the non-wealthy. I think the social issues are done. I didn't write, the precise, write down the precise numbers on this in terms of what people say is important to them. But I, I, I think it's also very easy to exaggerate how important they were in the past. So I, I think that... If, so, so, so Nolan here studies, studies elites, and there I would agree with his reading of the evidence that very clearly there is a, there's polarization. In the general public, I think the evidence for that is pretty slim. There may be a few more louder people that are at the extremes that are sort of you know, activists, but we would be talking about a fairly small sliver of the public. And, and they tend to, I think, get the attention of journalists and of policymakers and of pundits and and there is this this middle that is really a lot more centrist, moderate, or indifferent, depending on which perspective you take. So I, I don't think that these you know social culture wars of the mid two thousand somehow you know they, that they were so real and now they're so gone. I think they're still a little bit there, and they were never as big as we thought they were. What do you think this plurality of voters means when they say the most important issue to them is the economy? Like, I mean, you know, like, if I said the most important issue to me is pizza, then presumably I'm trying to figure out which candidate will give me the best pizza. Like, what's the, how, I, is, is there a bleed back of these policy issues into that where they, some, what, where they think something that perhaps has to do with the welfare state is a reason that one candidate is better on the economy than the other? I, th I think for many, for many voters, it's, it's more basic than that. It's like, have, are they, it's, it's essentially, are they better off than they, than they used to be or are they not? And then maybe there's some component that is more prospective about, do I expect to be better off under this guy or that guy in, you know, a year from now or four years from now? But I don't think that they connected in very sophisticated ways to specific policies or specific dimensions of well-being or how policy relates to that. Because I think the 47% the talk was sort of a, an account that is popular among some people on the right about how the welfare state has undermined the economy. The argument is basically that you have all these lazy people sitting around not doing anything because the government will pay them to. So I think, I, I, I feel like when a lot of conservatives talk about the, the, they care about the economy, I think they're talking about that. That they want people to go back to work and they want the government to stop paying people not to work. I, I think there's a, a large amount of partisan projection among voters. So they, they say they care about the economy. Uh, they they tend to be and they have a tendency to be Republican or Democrat, and then they tend to, you know, take on those policy prescriptions that their preferred party chooses. And so, a lot of it's not that voters are sitting around deciding whether or not uh, dependency is the issue in the election, and that's the cause of poor economics. They're concerned about the economy. Uh, the Republican elites and leaders tell them dependency, or you know too much federal spending or deficits or whatever uh, is the cause of the economic uh, underperformance. Uh, and then they ad adopt views consistent with those, with those messages. Uh, 
that's not true of every voter, but a, a lot of what you see in, in polling is kind of reflecting that projection. So it's very hard to kind of figure out, you know, you know, how much of these are true reason preferences among voters about how they're going to attach their vote to an issue that they care about. Um, so what's, what's the role that race is playing in the fact that we're having this discussion in this election cycle with the first black president? Because um, I think, you know, we're, as uh, several of you noted, the, a lot of these issues were sort of muted through the, through the 90s um, under President Clinton. Um, and the, you've seen some of these attacks with Newt Gingrich calling the president a food stamp president and this, the invention of, uh, of the gutting of the, of the, welfare, uh, of, uh, the welfare reforms of the mid-90s. Um, are these, do Republicans think this is especially effective because the president is black or because the, uh, they think that there are racial resentments to play on here or is that, is that more incidental? Any Republicans here? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I want to push that, let me, uh, I'm not volunteering as a Republican, but uh, <laughs> let me, uh, I want to put, first of all, push back, because you said it twice now, invention, invention of the, yes. of, the, uh, of the idea that the administration was trying to gut the welfare reforms. I think what, uh, you know, what uh, Romney said about that was an absurd exaggeration. I mean, he is, a, he is an extraordinarily clumsy, clumsy man. But there is, there is, the, but the, but there is a germ of truth to the idea... Yeah, a teeny bit, to the idea that this wasn't merely an attempt, as the administration claimed, to tighten the rules and get better results work-wise. In other words, make the work test uh, more effective. That's really what uh, Captain Sibeli said the claim she was doing. And I think, you know, it's pretty hard to, uh, to defend that view. I mean, the waivers that were being proposed were capable of providing the loosening of the work test. And if you uh, look at the people in HHS who were sort of working on that proposal, uh, some of them have been skeptics right from the beginning about the Clinton welfare reform. It's not outlandish to say they were looking for a way to make the system, as they would say, less tough, more civilized, more compassionate. And I don't think it's completely out of bounds to say that that is, you know, a um, a substantive alteration in the way the system works. Now, just want to repeat, Rom Romney uh, screwed it up uh, by, by exaggerating it and, made it made, and what he said was, was, was basically wrong. But there's, a, but there's a, a, a germ of truth to it. Now, so I just want to push back a little bit on invention. Let me come to, okay. to, to race. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is probably uh, actually undoubtedly more a question for political scientists than journalists, but I'll just give you my guess. I mean, it obviously goes, the, the race factor in this election, as in 08, I think goes, goes in both directions, and I'm not sure what the net effect is. I spent about half of my time in D.C. and about half of my time in West Virginia. The fact that Obama is black um, is a plus in D.C., and undoubtedly a negative, a net negative in West Virginia. There, the, there's racism in a lot of this country, and West Virginia probably has more than its fair share of racism. But on net, my guess would be that it's a positive for, um, uh, for Obama and for the Democrats in this election. And the reason I, I should disclose, I'm a British citizen, I won't be a US citizen for another two years. I can't vote in this election, but I'll be voting in the next one. And if I, but if I were voting this year and I examined my conscience and uh, were weighing up the two candidates, the fact that Obama is black would weigh in my calculation and it would be a positive. I would say it was a good thing. In fact, I did say I wrote, it's a good thing for the US to elect an extraordinary black man as president. About time that happened, good. Only in America, I said. I couldn't imagine this happening in Britain or Europe. Good for the US. And that fact has not gone away. It's still a consideration. And I think an awful lot of uh, politically moderate people in this country feel the same way. I think they feel it would be a damn shame um, if uh, this guy wasn't given uh, a second term, partly because he is black. Just my guess. 
I think that it, it's amazing and nothing, almost miraculous how little race has been an issue since Obama got elected. And I think he deserves a good deal of credit for that. And, um, well, it, it's, 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 a, it's one of the best things that's happened in this country in the past, uh, in the past 20 years, say. Um, and it, it hasn't played any role in these, these economic discussions. And I never hear people, um, I, don't, I don't often get to mingle with the, the people of West Virginia, uh, but it well, Shame on you. <laughs> uh, I've been saying things that they wouldn't want told in public. <laughs> you know, uh, about this. And I think if, if, if you told anyone 10 years ago, that when we be in the situation we are now, I think it would have been made. Yeah. I, I mean, it's fairly clear from the evidence in political science and the politics of uh, social policy that the kind of racial, racially diverse societies have much more difficult time uh, in creating and maintaining welfare states because of the, the worries that I expressed before that uh, groups often don't like to tax themselves to provide benefits for the others. So that's been true of the U.S. for a long time. It's true of other ethnically and r racially diverse societies. Um, so that's a, but I would argue that's more or less a constant in U.S. politics. I don't see evidence or think that it's gotten worse uh, in the past four years. It's just a, it's, it's just a fact about the U.S. I, I think so. I'm, I don't have all these numbers ahead of me mentally here. I think if I recall correctly, it was a net negative to Obama that he was black last time around. So um, that that there was the pre, that, that prejudice cost him more than the sort of the glory of voting for the first African-American um, won him. Um, but we're talking relatively small numbers. And I, I, anything small matters in close elections. So that's why I'm a little cagey here about putting a sort of a precise spin on it. But I think, I think it hurt him some. And so it's probably still present now. On the other hand, we don't totally understand, I think, how Mormonism affects Romney and whether that costs uh, him a little bit. Sorry. Uh, are, are the surveys on this to be trusted? Would you say? Um, when you ask people, are you a racist, do you expect them to give an honest answer? Well, we, we've become a little smarter than last time you checked how we do our research. <laughs> I, I don't think we use that question anymore. Um, <laughs> well, there, there's this thing, the Bradley effect. Is that no longer exists, which was after the uh, mayor of Los Angeles? Yeah, I know. I'm not sure that has actually ever been sort of confirmed. There is. There, there, there are these what's called implicit attitude tests that don't ask you directly whether you're racist, but try to get, um, get at that sort of through subliminal connections that you make. So I, 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 I am actually not an expert on that. objective process. No, I think it's, it's also controversial, but it's better than, than what you were sort of caricaturing. There. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, can I actually, so I don't yeah. know if, if I get to ask questions as well. Sure. So I would like to know from, from the panel whether any, since we're talking about the welfare state, I can't help but think that it's a colossal mistake on the part of the Romney campaign that we're talking about the welfare state here today. I think the moment that he... Do we just blame put, Romney for everything? No, 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 on this one, just wow. in terms of strategy. Uh, it, it, putting Ryan on the ticket and talking about the $900 billion there in the Medicare, I just, for the, I just cannot explain what, how that is how that makes any sense. We should be, if we, if, if Romney had, its, had, had done this smartly, we would be talking about state of the economy and only the state of the economy and then some uncontroversial proposals about how to get more people to work again. Well, and that's all. That's, but that's the, big, that's the big item right there. Like you need the underpants gnomes to bring you the, uh, the <laughs> uncontroversial economic growth proposals. Like, you know, the, I think Romney basically wanted to spend a year talking about, gee, the economy's terrible. Wouldn't it be nice if it were better? But when you actually start talking about proposals to have effects on the economy, you're either talking about things that don't really have big effects or that are the same things that Republicans were proposing five years ago before we had the economic crisis, um, or you might start talking about things that are unacceptable to the Republican base. So I think that Romney doesn't really have an explicit economic agenda that is likely to produce a lot more growth from the presidents. And so he doesn't, 
in some ways this serves as a, a distraction for him so that he doesn't have to lay out specific you know, and he didn't, Ron well, did not release that video oh. about the 47% right. you know that I'm sure he would just assume to let that go by if he did that <laughs> Yes. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think I agree with you that the, I was kind of startled that he chose Ryan in the first place, and then even more surprised that he backed away from, as it were, accepting the logic of having chosen Ryan. That's what I don't understand. I mean, you could say that it was a tremendous gamble. You, you could have perhaps ar have argued, I certainly did not, but like people did argue, that this was a bold, brave choice, and it showed that Romney was actually going to have the nerve to confront, um, you know, issues like entitlement, very controversial issues, where on the face of the Republicans are, don't have popular proposals. But he was damn well going to make the case for doing what they wanted to do. And Ryan was the guy to put that case before the public. Now, when, it, when, the, that, you know, when Ryan was first put on the ticket, I thought they must be mad to uh, you know, to, to think that that is going to be successful. But what they then did was even stupider, which was to have Ryan on the ticket and then t try to turn him into Romney. And so, so they aren't actually doing the only thing it might have made sense to do, having put Ryan on the ticket. I, I think it's completely bewildering. And the answer that the campaign gives is, oh, well, you know, it's nothing to do with, uh, you know, the House budget. It's nothing to do with about trying Medicaid, it's just personal chemistry. You know, they just got on great. So he put Ryan on the ticket. Who knows, maybe that's true. <laughs> I think it looks to me like this, the, the, the belief that in their own ideas was so strong that they thought they could convince major parts of the American public that they were right. And I think if political science teaches you anything, that's really just very You're unlikely. the first person I've ever met who accuses Romney of having strong belief in his own ideas. Yeah. <laughs> no, I no, I, I tend to agree. I mean, it, what, what goes against that argument is, is exactly the point Clive made. It's, it's, it would be one thing if, they, if he chose Ryan and they stuck with Ryan's plan, let Ryan be Ryan. But immediately, you know, Ryan takes, gives a speech at the convention and then starts attacking Obama for cutting Medicare. And then you realize the gig is up. You've, you've, <laughs> wasted, this you've wasted this opportunity for a serious argument about Medicare on a... You know, getting a you know a forty-two year old uh, House member to be your vice presidential Maybe candidate. Maybe they realized their mistake very quickly, to their credit. Well, or, or does this just go back to what Marcus said that you know there's not a whole lot of relationship between the campaign and the policy making, and that maybe he wants Ryan for policy making purposes, and there's no reason to saddle yourself with unpopular campaign points. It's it, they really maybe they just really do believe in the etch a sketch. And they, you know, <laughs> Romney clearly believes in that just catch over you know, career. It's gotten Romney this far. Yeah, that's true. Know, do, you, do you think that's, that's wrong that they've actually abandoned the idea of cutting Medicare? I don't know. That was your. Yeah, I, it'd be hard to predict any future position of. Ryan, you know, Ryan, Ryan's a true believer, isn't he? I mean, he wants to do that. There's no question. Is he? I, I don't Oh, you look at Ryan's, I mean, he, he voted for the Medicare prescription drug benefit. That's true. He's been a longtime supporter of the Davis-Bacon Act, which is most conservatives, the, the, this is a law that forces um, any federally funded construction project to pay prevailing union wages. He voted for TARP, both versions of it, including one that only got 30-some votes from, from Republicans in Congress. He voted for the auto bailout. And now that so he's, he's a secret liberal, in fact. Well, <laughs> it's not that he's a secret liberal, but that it's when when true believer conservatism has come into conflict with being a good soldier for the Republican Party. Right. He's gone with the Republican Party. Right. So well, I uh, sure, now, he, I think, and he's doing that now, isn't he? Yeah. I mean, he's, he, he's, he's supporting Romney rather than advancing his own, uh, forthrightly advancing his own, uh, you know, budget plan, his own budget priorities. That's been put on the, put on the back burner. But, I mean, it, it does seem to me that, that Ryan... Um, well, I mean, it, it, I was about to compare him with Romney in this respect, which perhaps not a not a very uh, illuminating comparison. But but Ryan is more has firmer convictions, it seems to me, than Romney does. I mean, he has a, he has a plan, and he thinks it would be good for the country. I think if he was a position in a position to push it through, he would do it, and he would he would think he was doing the right thing. It's actually quite hard to know what 
what Romney does think uh, needs to be done. I mean, I think that's a, that's a genuine mystery, and it's one of, the, one of the biggest problems in his campaign, I think. These fail to flesh out a coherent program, and um, it, it's just very hard to know what he, what he believes. Well, you just have to decide how big a liar he is. And if he's a big enough liar, the bigger liar he is, the more he can renege on all the right-wing positions he's taken. Right. So, so if, if you can convince yourself he's a big liar, then you might support him. Yeah. If, he, if, he, if, he won't, <laughs> if he's not a liar, then he's been... Then, yeah. Then well, I, I think he probably is quite a big liar. I mean, I think <laughs> that, uh, you know, he was a moderate, he was a moderate uh, governor. And I think that probably gives you a better sense of the kind of sort of, you know, pragmatic CEO style, uh, fix the problem uh, kind of politician, you know, he, he is in his bones. I mean, I think that's, that's what he genuinely is. And I think during the, you know, the primary contest, he faked, uh, he faked so his sort of Tea Party uh, credentials. And uh, the interesting thing is that he didn't feel having got the nomination that he could renege on, 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 those, on those guys, and that he could renege on what he told the party. And I think a lot of people, including me, expected him to tack back uh, well, powerfully he, to the center he, for the purposes of the election. He chose not to do, do that. And, and of course, the Ryan pick was a, was a, a strong sign right. that he wasn't going to do that. Right. Well, I think it was partly it became an, his flip-flops became an issue in, yeah, in itself, yeah, did, so, yeah, right. so that he, it made it much more, this was one thing the Democrats did rather skillfully, and it makes it very hard for him now to renege. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, I think psychologically, he, I think he probably has, I have no evidence for this, you know, that he's convinced, you have, you have to believe that you're, that you're a good, logical, con consistent person, and he probably wants to show all these people who say he's been flip-flopping that he isn't. And so he's leaning over backwards and, and, and the etch just catches him and put in the closet. Right. For now, yeah. Um, so I think uh, now would be a good time to take some questions from the floor. Um, if you could uh, come to the mics and uh, if we could, uh, especially we'd like to get some students in first, uh, if we have some. Uh, Princeton students uh, to pose questions. Um, and while we're waiting for that to happen, I'll, I'll actually ask one more question from the uh, moderator's prerogative, which is that one thing that we barely mentioned on this panel and that's been barely mentioned in this campaign is Social Security. And it's the, the largest and probably most important of what, what you would call the welfare state in the U.S. if we're going to call it that. And I'm wondering why that's been so absent, especially because it was actually a fairly big campaign issue during the Bush administration. Yeah, it's a, good, it's a very good question. I mean, uh, and I, I, again, I think that I don't want to sound like too much of a salesman for Bull Simpson, but I mean, the solution to the social security aspect of the problem isn't very difficult. The, the problem actually isn't that difficult. Nothing like as difficult as Medicare. You need, you know, a, a modest increase in the retirement age. Um, spread out over a long period. It's really, honestly, no big deal. When you look at the demographic pressures that other so, uh, social insurance systems are under in other countries, it, it, it's trivial. So I, I'm not sure why neither side feels they, uh, they, you know, they can confront the issue. I, I mean, if I were advising either one of them, I'd say, you know, grasp that nettle because you can explain. Uh, you can look, you know, thoroughly fiscally responsible, and it doesn't actually do that, cause that much pain how many, to fix how it. Many, it's not a question of causing pain. How many votes would it get you to say you were going to reform Social Security in this moderate, responsible way? Well, I think it would get you some. I mean, you and I have, Mike and I have had this discussion. We, that's right. But Mike and I have had this discussion, uh, you know, ma uh, many times. I, I think it would be an interesting experiment to just put, uh, you know, the truth of the situation before voters and see if they were capable of responding to it. You, you feel that's a waste of time. People are too stupid. You know, no one is no one's going to see the, the, the merits of the case. I just, I just would just like to see it tried well, once. in fact, Pete Peterson has a billion dollars that he's spending trying to put the case in front of people. And we'll see if that works. Yeah, but he is also, I mean, he's a fiscal zealot. He's, he wants to, 
tighten fiscal policy abruptly and quickly, which I think is wrong. And I think people sense that that's wrong under, under present circumstances. The whole point of, of a, a gentle social security reform is that you can do it over, de over decades. And, and the U.S. has done it before. They, we do, you know, the U.S. did it with the Greenspan Commission. It's just no big deal. It's not controversial once, once it's in place. One of the surprising things about it not being an issue is that during the Obama administration for the first time, uh, Social Security tax revenues uh, have fallen short of uh, the expenditures, and so the trust fund is ever so slightly decreasing. And so if you think about the politics of it, that's a fairly, you know, that's a fairly good 30-second ad uh, that, we haven't, that we haven't seen. So it's, so it's doubly surprising in that that's regard. True. Yeah. Sure. Hi. Uh, Thank you all very much for being here today. Fascinating conversation. Um, I wanted to address the other side of the coin. You uh, raised the issue of the president's race, so I thought I'd probably raise the issue of the Republican nominee's faith uh, and ask a three-part question. First, is it more benefit or detriment to him? Because I've seen arguments on both sides, although the Republican Party generally seems to be inclined to think it's a detriment, and they certainly seem to be playing this campaign that way. Uh, second, do we think the polling adequately reflects the sentiments of the American people about his faith? We certainly have IATs for race, but do we have them for faith? And if not, is there a way to actually pioneer them? Um. Marcus, I, think, I think that's up your alley. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't have a specific answer on that last point, whether there's actually been, been a trite way to look at this in, a, in this sort of, to get, to get people's attitudes subconsciously without Do we even making, think that, it, like, are people that subconscious about it, or be, do people legitimately think that they can say, I don't like that guy's faith, and it's not politically incorrect or improper to say that? Yeah, I, I, I think I have to punt on this a little bit. I don't know. I, so I think the only segment of the electorate where this could matter would be evangelicals on, on the Republican side that might decide not to vote. But if you look at the sort of the data on enthusiasm, that appears to be relatively high among Republicans, um, certainly up until sort of the, the very recent past, much higher than on the Democratic side. So it's hard for me to see strong evidence that this matters a lot. I think it's easier, far easier, to say openly, um, I don't want to vote for this guy because he's Mormon, than, than to say or think even, I don't want to vote for this guy because he's African American. And I think that, that um, having, and so I think that, that if I had to guess who's going to lose more votes, Romney because he's Mormon, or Obama because he's black, I would say Romney is going to lose more votes. Having said that, I think he's done a terrible job. He had an opportunity because to, uh, you, to educate people about Mormonism and, and its, its strong community base and its strong family emphasis and all the, all the good values that everyone wants. And he could have, he, he could have said, I'm a Mormon, and I want to tell you about Mormonism and make a very appealing case. But that was a little risky, so he didn't. I think the interesting thing is they, they did this at the convention on the final night, not in, prime, not, in, not in the part that was aired on the networks. And I thought it was actually a very well done program that it was, you know, brought people that he, you know, the families that he had assisted in various ways when they were in trouble. Um, yeah. And it was. It, it, I, I thought it actually was a, it was a strong pitch that they made, but they did it basically between eight and nine. And that was in really his watching. speech. He had one cent about being a Mormon. Yeah, that was, that was amazing, wasn't it? I mean, if we're listing the egregious errors of the Romney campaign to bump the you know the personal testimonies, which I thought were genuinely moving. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people moved to tears on stage and in the audience by these testimonies, you know, of, of what a nice guy he is. And, and they, that wasn't fit for prime time. We had Clint Eastwood on the chair instead. <laughs> Unbelievable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, could you just give your name first? Uh, sure. My name's Ben Horowitz. I'm a student here in the Wilson School. It seems like there's been a lot of discussion around Medicare and that particular aspect of the welfare state or lack thereof. I was wondering how unemployment, for one example, um, might play into this election, if at all, and also education, which isn't 
directly part of the welfare state, but definitely affects communities that are generally associated with the welfare state disproportionately when it comes to government funding. So do, does anybody think those two will be an, a factor in this election? But by unemployment, do you mean unemployment insurance specifically? Or uh, yeah. designed to, OK. Um, I, I don't see either of those playing the same type of role that uh, discussions about Medicare or, ta or you know, progressive taxation or uh, the other big elements. Uh, education obviously is tends not to tends not to be a particularly controversial issue at national levels because everybody's for good education. Now they have different views about what that what that is. Um, uh, the the Obama administration has been co-opting some themes of Republican criticisms of edu of, of, edu of education, uh, supporting charter schools and so forth. So it, it's a little bit harder. It's a little bit harder to attack uh, uh, the administration there. I mean, ironically, you have this uh, teacher strike, and you have this teacher strike in Chicago. Uh, it's uh, supervised by Rahm Emanuel, and it's one in which he takes a fairly hard line against teachers' unions, which is the other critique that Republicans often make about Democrats. And so, so I, 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 I don't see I don't see education uh, being there. Uh, unemployment insurance. Really, the arguments will focus on stimulus. I mean, extensions of unemployment insurance is kind of a favorite uh, way to stimulate the economy. It, you know, the criticism obviously is this dependency argument. So you might see some refer, you know, some debates about uh, extensions of unemployment insurance and, and its effects on willingness of people to seek work and so forth. But I, I don't think it'll play as big a role as the discussions of the other issues. Yeah, I, I think I agree with that. I mean, I think the discussion of unemployment uh, or the issue of unemployment is, is important in the election, but it's sort of, a, sort of at one remove from the policy debate. In, this, in other words, people, you know, there isn't much of an argument going on about the right approach to unemployment insurance. The argument is about whether the fiscal stimulus worked. And uh, you know, Democrats argue that it was necessary and it worked, and Republicans argue that it that it was a mistake and it's and, and it's failed. So that's an argument almost about how about why unemployment has stayed as high as it has. An argument about fiscal policy. Uh, I think I think that is politically uh, important. I think a lot of the arguments uh, offered uh, from the Republican side are very dumb on this, um, but uh, but but they seem to have a lot of purchase with. With a, lot, with a large part of the electorate. The fiscal stimulus failed. Fiscal stimulus has made unemployment worse. We need a, a different approach. I think that argument uh, resonates with, with a lot of Americans. As an economist, Clyde, is there any serious argument that you would, you would accept that, uh, that the stimulus uh, caused unemployment, increased unemployment? No, I mean, I think it's very hard. You, I mean, you can find economists who, uh, I mean, serious economists, good economists who would argue that the stimulus had, a, had only a small effect, um, but I don't think you could find any. I mean, Josh may know. I, ca I can't think of any who would argue uh, that it made unemployment worse. Um, and my own view for what it's worth, or what little it's worth, is that the stimulus should have been bigger, but I do think the Democrats made a mistake in the early days, the discussion about the stimulus, uh, by recasting it as a debate about uh, the size of government. You know, it was that, that thing of, you know, don't let a, a crisis go to waste. Uh, you, I was startled that in the, in, the, you know, in the first months of the Obama administration, uh, the row in Washington about the stimulus not, was not so much about how big it should be. It was about whether it should be pub, uh, extra, extra public spending or tax cuts. And the Democrats were, were fiercely aligned behind the view that tax cuts were a, were, wouldn't work. That was, the, that was the wrong way to go. And they wanted to pack as much public spending into the stimulus as possible. Um, and the problem with that is that it played into the narrative that said what's really going on here is a, is a, is, is a project to permanently enlarge the role of government. And I think the Democrats would have got a much a better result, meaning a bigger fiscal stimulus, if they'd be much more relaxed about letting tax cuts dominate 
and especially tax cuts directed to stimulating the labour market, payroll tax cuts. We've had some of those, but they could have been much bigger. And I think tactically that would have also made sense because it would have been very hard for the Republicans to object to a, a bigger fiscal stimulus that was bigger because of tax cuts. But because of the... I mean, it goes back to what we were discussing at the beginning, this polarisation issue. You know, tax cuts are the Republican approach, and so Democrats felt they had to oppose that, make a higher priority of opposing that than actually getting a bigger stimulus, which is what I think we needed. Just one amendment to that, but the Democrats were constrained in, in pushing forward payroll tax cuts because Republicans insisted that only taxpayers uh, should get uh, tax relief. And true. so that kind of ideological thing that reappeared with the 47 percent argument really played a role in constraining uh, these kind of lower end tax cuts. So they were on the table and they got taken off. I think going, going back to the unemployment insurance issue, I think, I think it's playing basically no role in, in the election. I think it's for an interesting reason. I think it sort of it had its heyday in, as a political issue in 2009 and 2010 where you had Republicans saying, and some economists I think not convincingly, saying that uh, extended unemployment insurance was inducing unemployment and that this was actually, that this was one of the key drivers, the high unemployment rate. And then you had Democrats feeling they could really make hay about the issue that Republicans wanted to basically throw these unemployed people out right. on the street right. and cause unemployment benefits to shrink from 99 weeks down to 26. You've had sort of a convergence on that. We've, we've, first of all, we've had a reduction in the length of, of unemployment benefits. The maximum is now 73 weeks and only 63 in, in, in many states. Um, and that law will expire at the end of the year. And I think regardless of who wins the election, there will be some reauthorization of, unextend, of extended unemployment benefits, but it will be again for less time. And as the economy gets healthier, we will step back again down to the 26-week level. I think unemployment insurance is is unique in that it's, this, it's the one welfare state program that really does have matter a lot for decisions about short-term short -term economic growth and reaction to the fact that we have you know, an, an output gap and that we have unused labor that, that, uh, that, that could be stimulated back into the market. Um, so I think the, um, but I think both sides are sort of done talking about what to do about our short-term economic problems. Mm. Um, Barack Obama basically feels like what ideas he had about uh, stimulating the economy he has put out there, and some of them can get enacted and some can't, and he has no more new ideas to push that, uh, that he thinks he can make political hay out of. And I think the Republicans don't have new economic ideas. They're running on the same economic platform that they ran on in, in, the, in the last cycle. And so therefore, it has no content about our, our unemployment crisis. So I don't think anybody really wants to talk about it. And I think the policy course on it is, is, is pretty close to predetermined. Hmm. Sounds right to me. Hi. Um, I, I'd just like to know any thoughts that you have. I keep reading the paper and trying to find answers to this, and I haven't, um, about the reasons that it appears to be anathema for candidates of either party to approach the idea of means testing around entitlements? Well, Romney, in his interview at 60 Minutes um, <coughs> on Sunday, came, basically did a call for means testing of, of Social Security and Medicare. He said on both of them that he, uh, he first of all, he did, Paul Ryan isn't running for president, I am. And then he said to both of them that he favors little bitty reforms that would, uh, that would uh, require more people of means than, than, than poorer people. And um, yep. so he's, he, I mean, I, you got it, he's done it. Yeah. Yeah. If, you, if you read between the lines of his, uh, of his uh, tax plan, which is to lower tax rates at the top without changing the middle, really the only possible way he could pay for it is to means test. Uh, benefits and to phase out uh, deductions like the home interest deduction at the very top of the income distribution. So it's kind of in there implicitly uh, in addition to kind of the explicit statements, yeah. But I think the simple reason that they don't say it out right is that it's, it's a loser as a proposition for election day, right? It might be sound public policy, but you know, this, this idea of, oh, we need to shrink the deficit, it, that sounds great at that level of generality, but then when you make it concrete about who would have to give up what? It, it's just hard to see how, how you, you could campaign on that idea. Yeah. And one other small point about the, the kind of the long-term politics of social policy is that many people on the left are hesitant to means test 
uh, benefits at the top for fear of the long-term political repercussions because, you know, the, the adage goes, once, a, once a, a program becomes a program for the poor, it becomes a poor program. Uh, and so one of the elements of the design of you know, the American entitlement programs is that they've been universal in the hopes that uh, higher income people will stay engaged and stay supportive of the programs. So, the, so even from the left, there's a, a real risk in, in means testing uh, in that you know, once high income people don't benefit from these programs as much, uh, that they're more susceptible to appeals uh, to reduce the generosity of those programs. Okay, well I think we're gonna wrap it up there. Um, thank you, everybody, for, for attending today. And um, I, I think this was a really fun discussion. And uh, we look forward to doing this again soon. Thank you.